Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. I am just getting the PowerPoints up now. We have a really special webinar in store for you all. Uh, we're going to have Chelsea Criddle, who is a PhD candidate at Tufts University, giving a talk about a future career in policy. And before we get going, I would like to start recording so those um, people who are not able to attend can watch it in a little bit. So bear with me one moment. All right, I think we're ready to get going. Thank you so much for joining us again. I'm Sarah Mancall. I'm the policy director here at the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. We also go by SPICI, and we are also known as Division 9 of the American Psychological Association. And I'm right now going to turn the webinar over to my colleague, Nu Ha, who is a PhD student and a member of the SPICI Graduate Student Committee. And she's the person who put, today, put together today's webinar. Thank you, Sarah. So um, I'm gonna start by talking about SPICI and a little bit um, information about the history of the organization before I introduce Chelsea. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, the Society for Psychological Study of Social Issues, or SPICI, was founded in 1936. Um, currently, we have over 3,000 um, scientists who are psychologists or other um, scientists in related fields who do research on the psychological aspects um, of social and policy related issues. SPICI seeks to bring theory and practice into focus on human problems that are related to the group, the community, and the nation um, at large. We also focus on issues that don't have um, national boundaries. Um, SPICI, as Sarah mentioned, is an independent um, society organization, but we're also Division 9 of the American Psychological Association, and we also are an affiliate of the American Psychological Society. Um, and so we're welcoming all of you, if you're not a current member, to become members. And so the link um, to go to our website and register to become a student or graduate student member um, is below. Oh, you know what, Nuha? Let me give you the keyboard and mouse again, because I don't think we're seeing the slides. If you could advance. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me know if you have any trouble and I can advance them. Yeah, um, I think you might have to do that because my. Yeah. Oh. Let's see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so SPICI's graduate student opportunities, we have a lot of great opportunities to become involved. First of all, we have our conference coming up in June. Um, so if you want to submit a proposal for the conference, um, the deadline is in December. Uh, we also provide a lot of opportunities for grant funding. Um, if you become a member, you'll get newsletters with updates about grant opportunities. Uh, we have some fellowship opportunities, some that are for current graduate students, some that are for postdoctoral students or people who are already in their early career. Um, we have some peer mentoring programs and you can um, write for our newsletter. So the student committee has the rookie um, and the quarterly um, newsletters that come out. Um, and so if you want to be a student member and get involved with some of these opportunities, it's only $25 for your first time registration fee and the link is there as well. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. 
Um, and so you can also look to spissy.org um, for more information. Um, the video of this webinar will be posted on YouTube afterwards for those of us who are unable to make it or maybe unable to be here for the whole time. Um, and then if you're interested in joining our list of policy methodology webinars, um, you can use this link below. So we'll have another methodology webinar coming up um, later this month that we'll talk about at the end of this presentation. Um, a slide got skipped, but if you have any questions during the presentation or that you want to ask of Chelsea, you can type them into the text box um, on the GoToWebinar. I'll be keeping track of the questions as we go through and then um, can kind of pose them when we get to that part of the presentation. Um, or if you want to ask a question later, you can email Chelsea. She's provided her contact information um, to do that as well. And Chelsea, this is Sarah. I just gave you control of my key, my mouse, so hopefully you should. Uh, excellent. Okay, let's see. So while we're getting control of that, I'll introduce Chelsea. So she's the member of the Social Cognitive Lab at the Social Identity and Stigma Lab at Tufts University. Um, she earned her bachelor's in psychology with a minor in comparative women's studies um, at Spelman College in 2015. And then she earned her master's at, in social psychology at Tufts in 2017. Um, her research interests include allyship, racial gender bias, and confrontation. In particular, she is interested in exploring ways to reduce the negative effects of racial and gender bias in different contexts. And Chelsea is currently investigating the ways in which allies can use their identities to effectively confront bias. I thank you for the introduction, Nuha. Um, Sarah, I don't think it's working for me to advance the slides. Okay, I will then, um, I will either advance the slides for you or I can change you to the presenter. What would you prefer? I think changing me to the presenter would be great. Okay. Let's see if my computer will let me do that. Sorry about that, guys. Chelsea, I don't think my computer will let me do that right now. Can I advance them for you, if you tell me? Yeah, I have a lot of animation, so that might be. Oh. <laughs> but um, we'll work through it. OK. I could try giving you, yeah, my computer is not liking this at all. OK. Do you want to try the um, to hand over this mouse one more time? Yeah, I keep getting a, um, my computer is thinking very hard sign. OK. Okay, well, we can just get started if that works best. Okay. Okay, great. So my name is Chelsea Criddle, um, and I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at Tufts University. And so I wanted to talk today about a glimpse at a future career in policy. So the path to influencing policy for psychologists is often super unclear. Um, since I was an undergrad at Spelman College, I knew that I was interested in impacting policy, but I wasn't exactly sure on how to get there. So I thought that I had to be a lawyer or a politician, but that's absolutely not the case. And today I'll be focusing on the different routes that psychologists can take in influencing policy. And we can advance to the next slide. Sarah. Yeah, I've already advanced it on my screen. Oh, gotcha. It hasn't advanced on yours yet? No, it hasn't. I 
I could try closing out of the file and then maybe opening it again. Chelsea, do you want to get started in the meantime, and I will catch up to you with the slides? I'm um, sure we can do that. Um, so just a quick overview of today's webinar. I'll start by talking about the avenues that psychologists can influence policy. I'm focusing specifically on universities, intermediary organizations, and government. So within each avenue, I will highlight psychologists and organizations that are doing policy work in those arenas. I'll also be discussing um, some of the limitations and benefits of each approach, and I will then discuss how graduate students can prepare for the avenue of their choice. And then we'll end off with questions. So a lot of the information that I'll be discussing will be stemming from the book, Influencing Social Policy by Kenneth Matten. So it's a really great resource for individuals interested in learning more about the role of psychology in policy. So the book has interviews from 79 different psychologists and in different roles within policy, and it really give, goes in depth about the policy making process. So for anyone considering a career in policy who is a psychologist, this is a great resource. So in addition to the Influencing Social Policy book, I'll also be reflecting on my experience working in policy this past summer. So as a quick overview, I was BISI's 2018 Domus Taylor Summer Minority Policy Fellow. So this involved me spending half of the summer at SPISI and the other half at um, APA. So while at SPISI, I was able to attend congressional briefings to learn more about a range of issues, including immigration, domestic violence, and funding for higher education. I also got a better sense of the federal legislative process through meetings with individuals working for Congress and federal agencies. I was also able to construct a public comment on behalf of SPICI in response to the Federal Commission on School Safety's proposal to implement armed guards in schools. Complementing this letter, I presented a speech at the Department of Education headquarters, stressing the importance of the use of empirical research to inform policy decisions. In addition, I was able to to attend the 2018 SPICI conference and engage in a policy workshop focusing on how researchers can effectively use social media to disseminate policy relevant research and engage key figures in the policy arena. So the second half of my summer I spent the APA and I worked on a diverse range of policy topics including women's reproductive rights, poverty and work requirements, and disparities in school discipline. I had the opportunity to, opportunity to establish a briefing document and draft multiple policy comments on behalf of APA. I also wrote a blog on racial disparities and the maternal mortality crisis in the US. And lastly, I gained experience, um, advocacy experience by meeting with Congress members from my home district and discussing the importance of diversity in mental health care. And so now I have a graphic which will be kind of difficult to discuss without the, the visuals. Chelsea, um, can you go ahead? My computer is frozen and I'm afraid to do something because then I might turn the whole webinar off. <laughs> so if you can keep going and as soon as my computer unfreezes, I will try to open up the slides again. Okay, so I have a um, graph displaying the policy making process, which is pretty complex, but um, to simplify it, there are key players within the policy making process. So this process includes the media and the internet, citizens, academic faculty working at universities, advocacy and intermediary organizations, as well as the government, which includes the legislative, executive, and judicial branch. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on universities, specifically academic faculty at these universities, intermediary organizations, which includes um, policy-focused organizations that are external to the government, and the government, um, specifically focusing on the legislative branch and the executive branch. And so starting out with um, university faculty in the policy arena, 
So academic institutions are uniquely positioned to influence social policy at the local, state, and national levels. So faculty have the opportunity to promote policy-related ideas and programs, work with professional associations and advocacy organizations, and serve as policy advisors and consultants. So this summer, I saw a great example of psychologists influencing policy on the local level. So two professors, Dr. Emily Liskinen and Dr. Leah Warner from Ramapo College of New Jersey, were concerned when they discovered the local school district was planning to place class three armed guards at every elementary school. So the issue was outside of the area of research expertise, but they reached out to SPICI and worked diligently to find empirical evidence showing that this was a problematic response to school shootings. So alongside concerned community members, they were able to successfully stall the plan and change the mind of several board members by pre presenting research that showed why this was an issue. So as of now, this community group has successfully prevented armed guards from being implemented in their district. And so I thought that was a very good example of how um, psychologists can expectedly and unexpectedly influence policy through their research skills. And so now I'll move into um, research and policy centers on college campuses. And so research and policy centers can be a source of interdisciplinary policy relevant research, collaborations, uh, meaningful policy activities, and training for policy focused researchers and policy practitioners. And so the first center that I highlighted is the Center for Policing Equity at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. So this center was co-founded by social psychologist Philip Goff and it aims to bridge the divide of communication, generational mistrust, and suffering between communities and law enforcement. So the next is a center on the developing child at Harvard University, which focuses on um, children facing adversity. The next is the Center for Law and Social Policy at the University of Nebraska, which focuses on advancing policy solutions for low-income people. The next is the Institute for Research on Poverty, at University of Wisconsin-Madison, which focuses on identifying the causes and consequences of poverty and inequality in the United States. The next is the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity, which focuses on childhood obesity, poor diet, and weight bias. And lastly is the social, social psychological answers to real world questions at Stanford University, which is a do tank whose mission is to create and share social psychological insights with people working to improve policy. And so now I would like to highlight the accomplishments of a few university faculty working in policy. So the first being Suzanne Fisk, who received her PhD in social psychology at Harvard University. And she is currently a professor of psychology and public affairs at Princeton University, and her policy area is gender discrimination. So Dr. Fisk provided expert testimony that was cited by a US Supreme Court case in Price Waterhouse versus Hopkins. So this was a landmark decision which extended employer liability for gender bias. Dr. Fisk was invited to provide testimony based on her prior published research on gender stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination. And since that case, she has provided testimony in court depositions and a number of other activities. So another psychologist that I'd like to highlight is Dr. Mazarine Banaji. She is currently a professor of social ethics at Harvard University, and she received her PhD in social psychology at The Ohio State University, and her policy area focuses on criminal justice. So Dr. Banaji, along with Dr. Anthony Greenwald, was influential in several death penalty cases. Most recently, the state of Washington Supreme Court just struck down its death penalty, and judicial understanding of implicit bias was central to this decision. So now I'd like to read a quote from the judicial decision, which reads, the death penalty is invalid because it is imposed in an arbitrary and racially biased manner. Given the evidence before this court and our judicial notice of implicit and overt racial bias against black defendants in this state, we are confident that the association between race and the death penalty is not attributed to random chance. So this is a great example of how psychological research, specifically research focusing on implicit bias, can and has influenced the policy making process. So our last psychology university facu faculty member that I wanted to highlight is Dr. Hirokazi Yashikawa. 
So he received his uh, PhD in clinical psychology from New York University. He considers himself a clinical community psychologist and is currently a professor of globalization and education at NYU. His policy area includes undocumented immigrants and adult education. So Dr. Yoshikawa produced a book lens study that aimed to detail the daily lives of parents who work in extremely low wages, low wage jobs with low access to benefits and few opportunities to learn new skills. In this book, he examines the impact of undocumented parent status on their child's early childhood learning and development. In tandem with the New York Immigration Coalition, Dr. Yoshikawa's work led to New York being the first U.S. city to fund adult education for undocumented parents. He also contributed to the policy implementation by consulting with local sites to develop strategies for outreach to the undocumented parents. And so university faculty members noted several benefits as well as limitations to influencing policy via institutions. So one benefit is intellectual freedom. So professors have more freedom to select the questions that they wanna ask. And so as someone who was not interested in science in academia, this is probably gonna be the biggest thing that I miss is just being able to um, see a social issue and developing research attempting to answer that issue. Another benefit that was listed is job security and flexibility. So if you're on a tenure track, then your job is pretty much stable for as long as you want to be there. Another benefit to influencing policy via univer universities is um, working with graduate students. So being able to work with and mentor students who are passionate about research was listed as a plus by several um, faculty members. So limitations of influencing policy via um, academic institutions include the lack of incentives to do policy work. So ac academia is largely, largely operates under this publish or perish dynamic. So you're expected to constantly show that you're being a productive researcher and not necessarily a productive policy influencer. So if you're a junior faculty member in particular, you might feel more pressure to focus on publishing and things that'll get you promoted rather than policy work. And so the next limitation kind of stems from that, which is um, balancing publishing, teaching, grant writing, and policy work. So since you're not rewarded within the institution, you're more likely, you will more than likely need to conduct policy work on your own time, unless you're at one of those research centers that I mentioned previously. So overall, if you love the autonomy and nature of research, just for the sake of conducting research, and you're interested in applying those findings to the real world settings, then influencing policy via academic institutions might be the most um, suited for you. And so now I wanna go into working in policy focused intermediary organizations. So intermediary organization serves as a bridge between policymakers and policy interested parties, which includes citizens, communities, systems, and university-based researchers. So these organizations include advocacy groups, professional membership organizations, think tanks, the National Academies, research evaluation and consulting organizations, grassroots community organizing, and foundations. And so for the purpose of this webinar, I'll be focusing specifically on professional membership organizations, think tanks, and research organizations. And so a wide range of professional membership organizations exist in the US that serve the interests of their members through multiple means, including policy and advocacy. So first, focusing on SPICI. SPICI is very much focused on influencing public policy with empirically sound research findings. In order to achieve these goals, SPICI facilitates congressional briefings, uh, members and staff prepares policy position statements, and also leads workshops and social policy for members. So the largest psychological organization focused on impacting policy is the American Psychological Association. So this summer, I worked in the Public Interest Directorate, specifically in the Government Relations Office. So this director, directorate employs a number of legislative officers, a number of who are psychologists who lobby to Congress. Policy issues of interest of the APA include civil rights, criminal justice, gun violence, physical and mental health, health disparities, immigration, interpersonal violence, socioeconomic status, and suicide prevention. Similar to SPICI, APA um, 
attempts to get their members involved in the policy process by holding congressional briefings and providing testimony, by educating psychologists in local and national advocacy. APA also often has advocacy days and educating politicians on the contributions of psychology to public policy issues. So over the summer, while I was at APA, I was able to meet with um, staffers from the office of C Senator Elizabeth Warren and Senator Markey, as well as my district's um, house rep. And I was able to talk to them about the importance of mental health in under underrepresented communities. And so, I provided a list of professional membership organizations that are divisions of APA and focus on social issues with policy implications. So a lot of them have policy committees and opportunities to write policy statements and other relevant work. So these divisions include Division 7, which is developmental psychology, Division 9, which is Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, SPICI, Division 17, which is Society of Counseling Psychology, Division 27, which is Society for Community Research and Action. Division 34, which is Society for Environmental, Population, and Conservation Psychology. Division 35, which is the Society for the Psychology of Women. Division 37, which is the Society for Child and Family Policy and Practice. Division 44, which is the Society for the Psycho Psychology of Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity. Division 45, which is the Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnicity, and Race. And lastly, Division 48, which is the Society for the Study of Peace, Conflict, and Violence. And so now I want to move on to um, organizations that fall into the category of think tanks and research evaluation and consulting organizations. So these groups often conduct systematic lit reviews, major evaluations, and policy consultations by experts who include psychologists who contribute to the social policy areas, or areas such as welfare reform, international development, and poverty. And so I provided just a list of a few um, organizations that I was exposed to over this past summer, which includes the Lab at DC, Brookings Institution, Center for American Progress, the Raven Group, RAND Corporation, Urban Institute, and American Institutes for Research. So a lot of these organizations host discussions for the community on important topics. For example, I attended a talk this summer at the lab at DC that was focused on maternal mortality rates and the disparities in this impact on Black women, specifically in the DC area. I also attended a panel at Brookings Institution on evidence-based policy in the Trump era and a talk at the Center for American Progress on climate change and the silencing of science. And so now I wanna highlight a psychologist who's in the intermediary organizations arena. So psychologist, um, David Yoakum, he received his PhD in psychology, um, focusing on cognition and neural systems from the University of Arizona. So David Yoakum is the senior advisor and founding director of the lab at DC. The lab is supported by a $3.2 million grant from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, and is part of the Mayor Muriel Browser's administration in the Office of Budget and Performance Management. So the lab works on a wide range of, works with a wide range of agencies, universities, industries, nonprofits, and community groups, and their team is composed of professionals from very various backgrounds, including the public and private sector, the military, and academia. And they um, cover a wide range of expertise, including psychology, public policy, economics, political science, data science, public health, and law. So the lab aims are to design policy and program interventions that are tailored to DC based on theory and evidence for academic industrial research. Current projects include body cameras to improve policing, flexible rent programs to address homelessness, and a form of Palooza to systematically improve all government forms. And now just talking about the benefits and limitations. So the different types of intermediary organizations differ greatly in their mission, size, policy influence activities, and representations of psychologists. No different, psychologists within this domain use their relationship building skills, communication, research, strategic skills, along with 
content expertise to bridge the worlds of research, practice, and policy. So one of the first benefits that are highlighted is that you can start before you get your degree. So a lot of these organizations have graduate student internships, and I know that SPSB has a listserv specifically for non-academic internships, and that's how I found out a lot about a lot of these internship opportunities. Another benefit is that you're working with countries' leading experts. So as I said before, these are not just psychologists, they're individuals whose academic backgrounds are in public health and economics um, policy. And so you're able to learn a lot about um, research outside of your own personal area. Another benefit is that um, individuals are able to generate reports for national audiences. And so working in academia, academics often write articles for other academics within scientific journals, but intermediary organizations reach a large audience. Next is you're able to conduct research without the constraints of publish or perish, which is always a plus. And the last benefit is that you're able to have a greater influence over policy. So compared to academic faculty, intermediary organizations have greater policy influence. Um, one of those reasons being is that they're in Washington, D.C., and they often conduct research with policy in mind. So limitations to influencing policy via an intermediary organization is that they are sometimes seen as a biased institutions with their own agendas. So for example, um, the American Psychological Association is often seen as a liberal organization with liberal biases. They're seen as operating out of their own beliefs and values rather than psychological research findings. Another limitation is that they're money dependent. So some organizations are funded by foundations or administrations, and sometimes the money dries up, which might not allow for a, a stable situation compared to a tenure track position. And lastly, even though they have more of a policy influence than academic faculty, they still aren't the most influential. And so overall, if you're interested in having one foot in research and one foot in policy, then this might be the most suitable um, avenue for you. And so now I wanna discuss working as a policy insider. So in terms of direct access to policy, policy insiders often work directly under policy makers. So they become policy insiders through an appointment by an elected official, civil service appointment with an executive branch, or through direct election. And these policy insiders are situated at all levels of the government, which includes federal, so for example, a congressional staffer, at the state level, which includes an appointed official, and at the local level, which might include an elected city councilwoman. And so now I want to highlight a psychologist policy insider. So first I want to highlight Leticia Wallace, who received her PhD in educational psychology from Northern Illinois University. Leticia Wallace is a state representative for the Illinois House of Representatives. Before going to work in policy, Dr. Wallace spent more than a decade counseling children and adults in need of mental health services, including child abuse, victims, and families in crises. She assessed nonviolent criminals and worked to treat their addictions in order to get at the root cause of the problem instead of wasting taxpayer dollars on incarcerating them. She then completed her doctoral studies in educational psychology, focusing on racial identity and racial discrimination. She then worked as a chief of staff to a former state representative and then went on to run herself. So this is an example of a psychologist impacting um, policies specifically within the legislative um, government branch of government and at the state level. So next I wanna highlight um, Dr. Sarah Oberlander who received her PhD in applied social psychology at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. So Sarah Oberlin is a social science analyst in the office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in the US Department of Health and Human Services. Her work focuses on teen pregnancy and currently, she oversees the review for the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Evidence-Based Initiative, which is administered by the Office of Adolescent Health. This initiative includes an allocation of $175 million of federal funding toward expanding the use of evidence-based teen pregnancy programs, as well as supporting innovative and untested programs to build an evidence base. So this is an example of a psychologist impacting the executive branch of government at the national level.
So the last person that I want to highlight is Angel Colin Rivera, who received his PhD in social, com social community psychology from the University of Puerto Rico. So Angel is a senior policy advisor working for Senator Bob Menendez. He was a 2009 Spicy Domus Taylor Policy Fellow and was a 2010 James Marshall Public Policy Fellow. He then went on to work for the U.S. House of Representatives as a policy advisor, where he worked on issues related to human trafficking, immigration, housing, homelessness, postal reform, and arts and entertainment. He then went on to work for the Senate, working as an assistant to a U.S. Senator and an immigration and foreign services caseworker. He now works as a senior policy advisor. So this is an example of a psychologist impacting the legislative branch of government at the federal level. And so now I wanna go into a bit more detail about the James Marshall Fellowship that I, that I talked about earlier, as well as other fellowships that allow recent graduates with PhDs the opportunity to work for the government in either the executive or legislative branch. So the SPICI James Marshall Fellowship, as well as the APA Congressional Fellowship, allows recent PhDs to work for one year in a um, congressional member's office or on a congressional committee. And so this summer I network I networked with a lot of different people who participated in the congressional fellowships, and they worked with um, senators such as Cory Booker, Senator Bernie Sander, and Senator Maggie Hassan. And they were paired with their senators based on um, mutual or shared policy interests and expertise. So another fellowship that I'd like to highlight is the Congressional Black Caucus Fellowship. So this one differs from the Spicy and APA Fellowship, being that this one is 20 months long and you spend half of your time working in a congressional member's office and the other time focusing working in a committee office. So you get the two different perspectives with that internship fellowship, excuse me. And lastly, APA also offers a fellowship for the executive branch. So recent PhDs are able to spend one year working in executive branch science mission agencies. So placement often includes the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of Education, as well as the Department of Justice. And so a lot of organizations have these fellowships and a lot of them stem from um, AAAS. So I encourage you to do some research to find the one that's right for you. Something that I do personally is I follow um, AAAS on Twitter and I get a lot of information about internships, as well as perspectives from people who have um, our current or past fellows. And so now I want to discuss the benefits and limitations to influencing policy as a policy insider. So the biggest benefit is the ability to influence policy. So if that is your ultimate goal, then you have the direct ear of a senator or house of representative that you're working for. And the only thing closer to policy making is to be the actual policy maker yourself and run for Congress or for president. So for limitations, um, one limitation that was cited was um, restrictions and ability to speak freely on policy issues. And so um, policy insiders are limited in their ability to speak publicly on their personal ideas and perspectives because they're representing the views of their senator or congressperson. And so since you are working in D.C. on the Hill, you are involved in politics. And so you have to pay, play the political game. Another limitation is that your areas of expertise aren't as important. So in graduate school, a lot of your time is spent on focusing on this one thing, whether it be stereotyping or prejudice or gender. And so your identity as a researcher and your brand revolves around the research that you're doing. So if that's something that satisfies you, then working on a breadth of issues like immigration or opioids or homelessness might not be as fulfilling compared to working on your sp one specific area of expertise. And so, depending on your perspective, you might consider that a limitation. So overall, if conducting, actually conducting research isn't as important to you, and your main objective is to influence policy with empirical research, then this avenue might be the best for you. So overall, psychologists play a wide variety of roles within the policy arena. So even then within each avenue, the roles differ drastically. And the best way to get a glimpse at your future career policy is getting involved now. And so now I'll be discussing how graduate students can start gaining experience within universities, intermediary organizations, and government. 
So graduate students can start by um, conducting policy relevant research. So you can focus on practical policy implications rather than conceptual theoretical considerations when designing research. So this might be difficult if your program is more theory based and applied, but it's still worth it to think about how the policy relevant implications when designing your studies. So thinking about the methodologies and who is this research impacting, even if you're not going out in the community and actually implementing interventions. The next thing graduate students can do within universities is invite input from policy informed faculty and or policy practitioners on how to increase the policy relevance of your research projects. Um, so being your master's thesis, your dissertations, grant proposal, always keep it in mind, um, how do you translate this to policy? Like how is this relevant to today's social climate and what we're experiencing now? And lastly, graduate students can seek out faculty, university research centers, and policy institutions on ways to get involved in specific policy relevant projects. So SPICI had a webinar a while back that focused on specific ways that graduate students can reach out to policymakers or policy, policy relevant academics um, in order to gain sort of mentorship in the policy arena. So if that's still available, then I would suggest you all go and reach out those Look, look for those tangible ways to engage with um, policymakers. And so next with intermediary organizations, a lot of places like RAND, Brickings Institution, APA, and SPICI have summer internships that allow students to gain experience. So of course, SPICI has the Damas Taylor Minority Fellowship. And for those of you who are interested in applying, if you have questions about my experience, I'd be happy to answer. So SPICI also has an Applied Issues Internship, as well as a Local and State Level Policy Work Award. So currently, I am working with the Research to Policy Collaboration as a volunteer intern. So the Research to Policy collab Collaboration grew out of support from the National Prevention Science Coalition, and the purpose is to be a bridge between research and policy, focusing partnership between research experts and legislative staff. And so the reason for the research to policy collaboration was this awareness and this um, lack of training or guide in researchers trying to influence policy. So the purpose of this graduate internship is to allow graduate students to gain experience while they're still in graduate school and how to impact policy. And so some of the intern activities include joining meetings with legislative staff and the RPC coordinator, contributing to policy briefs or op-eds, and evaluating and optimizing strategies for infusing research into public policies. And so again, if you're interested in learning more about the research to policy collaboration, I'll be happy to talk more about my um, specific role within that um, organization. And so lastly, if you're interested in gaining experience as a graduate student, as a policy insider, you might be interested in interning on Capitol Hill during the summer in congressional offices or committees. You can also intern at local congressional offices, being that members have offices in DC and in their local district. And so my um, senator from Massachusetts is Elizabeth Warren. So if I were to just um, go to her page, I'll see a tab for internships and I can get a brief overview of the different tasks um, as an intern. And so an example of a Capitol Hill intern um, activity includes opening and sorting mail, answering and responding to constituent calls, giving tours of the Capitol, working with the administrative team, attending hearings, briefings for staff, conducting research, et cetera. And so local intern activities include similarly opening and sorting mail, answering or responding to, to constituent calls, helping staff with advanced policy work, and conducting policy relevant research. So a lot of these activities, um, such as opening and sorting mail, are more so geared towards undergrads. And as a graduate student, these tasks might not seem meaningful. But from what I came to understand from my summer, working in the Hill and networking, is that a lot of advancing to the next level in DC government is about paying your dues and working your way to the top. So coming into DC, with the PhD does mean a lot, but that firsthand sort of nitty gritty experience is highly valued overall. So hopefully you all have a better understanding of a glimpse at a, at a career in policy as someone with a PhD in psychology and the different routes that you can take. And that's all I have now Instead of, in terms of content, I'll be happy to take any questions. 
Thank you. Um, so if anyone has questions, you can write them in the chat box so that we can see them and start addressing your questions. And as we're waiting for people to type their questions, Chelsea, I was wondering if you would talk more about kind of like what experience you might want to get before applying to some of those graduate student fellowships and internships that you talked about. Yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of experience, I believe, since I'm a social psychologist, a lot of the work that I do centers around social issues. So mm -hmm. I think what helped me is being able to have a clear understanding of how my work translated to policy issues. And so I know the big thing during the interview was talking about specifically, okay, not just communicating my research findings to other academics, but how do I relay what I'm studying to people outside of um, academia? Also, mm -hmm. I've been involved locally in the Boston area, but also before I came to Boston in undergrad, um, volunteering at a lot of different organizations, um, specifically involving education and um, homelessness, et cetera. And so that just that real world experience and being involved with social justice, as well as doing social issue relevant research was really helpful. Great, thank you. We have time for some more questions. If people can type them in the chat box or I have some more questions. Nuha, I don't know if this is affecting it, but since my screen is somewhat frozen, I wonder if people aren't able to type and and send um, questions. Uh, okay. Yeah, that might be an issue. Um, I have a couple of other questions too, so I, maybe I can throw them out there. Um, hopefully that addresses some things that people might be wondering about. Um, Chelsea, I was also wondering what was the most challenging part of the work that you had done or could see experience with and then what was like more rewarding? Yeah, for sure. So some of the challenges, um, DC is just a very fast paced environment compared to being a graduate student doing research, which is extremely slow and there's a lot of just delayed gratification. But working on the Hill, things move very fast. Um, the issues that I worked on during um, the summer include maternal mortality and homelessness and immigration and things that I didn't have a great understanding of coming in. Yeah. So a challenge was to like learn about those things and almost become an expert in such a short amount of time and then let that go and move on to the next thing because that's just the nature of um, DC. And so another challenge was like reading through a lot of these policy documents and understanding the language in order to be able to draft a comment and respond to it. Um, and so I think the one of the most rewarding parts of my summer came really early on when I gave the speech at the Department of Education. So initially I was just writing a public comment on behalf of SPICI that addressed the Federal Commission on School Safety's decision to implement armed guards in school. And so I was doing my research on it and felt great about doing my part. And then um, Sarah came up and was like, hey, do you wanna give a speech at the Department of Education in like two days? And so I was extremely nervous. This is like less than a week into the fellowship, but it was um, absolutely amazing just to hear um, other people's perspective. They had like parents and um, other researcher and teachers. Um, and everyone's basically in agreement on why this would be a very bad idea. And so I got a lot of people come up to me afterwards and just thanking me about my perspective as a researcher and the need to use research in order to inform policy decisions. Wow, yeah, that sounds great. Um, another question I was thinking about, is there something that you wish you would have known before starting to do um, this work or something along those lines? Yeah, I think that, um, so 
the three points that I made about graduate students being able to do policy relevant research, I think now that I'm approaching my dissertation, I'm thinking really um, heavily about how exactly is the way that I'm designing this study and the way that I'm acting, asking this question going to impact policy. And so mm -hmm. at every step, I'm like, okay, how can a professor use this? How can an organization use this? How can just people use this research in order to better the lives of others? And so I think early on in my graduate career, um, I was still doing the same type of research, but not really with the questions about, okay, how can people actually utilize this information to better other people's lives? So I think, I mean, on one hand, that's just the nature of, um, like a theory based program, like you kind of have to go into depth about about the theory um, driving these phenomena. But I think maybe after about a year or two, focusing more on the policy implications would have been would have been nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was a great point, trying to tailor the research that you're doing now to answer policy questions or relate to policy work. Um. Yeah, it looks like people are unable maybe to send in questions. Maybe what I can do um, is start up a kind of Q&A discussion thread, and that way people can submit their questions. And Chelsea, um, if you have the time, you can kind of respond to the questions that people have. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Despite the technical difficulties, my computer screen is still frozen. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I loved having Chelsea in our office this past summer, and I know that my APA colleagues also really enjoyed having her um, to really assist in their policy work. And so just to wrap things up, I um, would like to remind you that the SPICI conference is in San Diego in June, and we are accepting proposals now. The APA conference is going to be in Chicago in August, and we are also accepting proposals for that, for SPICI's program. Um, after this call is over, I will send you all the slides and the recording, and I'll get a um, discussion thread going as well. And then just to give you a heads up, our next webinar is going to be methodology focused, and we're going to be talking about mouse tracking. And that is going to be on November 30th, so stay tuned for details. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Nuha. And I look forward to seeing you all hopefully at our next webinar. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.